Welcome to the Legal Navigator podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca from Law Training Center. Today, we're delving into the journey of how aspiring legal professionals can transform into successful lawyers. We're joined by special guest, Grant Sanders, who currently serves as a partner and compliance officer for legal practice at Stephen Rimmer Solicitors. Grant brings a wealth of experience in digital transformation, people management, and risk and compliance. Our inspiration for today's episode actually comes from a thought-provoking post by Grant. This post offers invaluable advice on transitioning from a paralegal role to that of a lawyer, making it a must listen for those who either want to um, aspire to start a career in law or just generally already part of the legal field. So we will delve into Grant's insights on this later in this episode. But before we do, Grant, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you on. How are you? Good. Thank you very much for inviting me. So if you could just share a bit about your background in the legal field with our listeners, that would be great. Okay. So um, as Rebecca said, my name is Grant Sanders. Uh, I'm qualified chartered legal exec, but I'm no longer fee earning. I try to balance the day-to-day running of Stephen Rimmer Solicitors with growing it and growing its people. Great. So what actually initially inspired you to pursue a career in law and become involved in the legal industry? I, I actually, I get, I'm lucky enough to interview a lot of people and I always ask that question. So it's, it's quite <laughs> nice to be asked that question back again. It's, I, I didn't have the, the traditional route. So my dad was a bus driver. My mum looked after my brother, who's severely autistic. I didn't have any relatives in law. I didn't know anybody in law. I was OK at school, um, but I didn't do A-level law. I didn't go to university to study law after. So as I said, probably not the most traditional start. On leaving school, I applied for an entry level job uh, as an admin person at our local magistrate's court. And uh, I was lucky enough to get that. So I was supporting the legal aid and licensing officer for there for for quite a while. Uh, Whilst I was there, I found out about the Silex qualification, but the court didn't support that. So I actually wrote out to every solicitor's firm in sort of the three towns around me. I must have written to 30 law firms. Uh, I only got two, only two responses. Uh, so that's why I, I always try to, when I can, personally respond to all of the applications because I, I know how disheartening that can be when you make an yeah, application you don't hear anything really back. Good. Uh, so I had yeah two responses. The first was to uh, work in the Wills and Probate Department, uh, supporting their starting starting as a legal assistant paralegal, and the other was to start in the post room. Now I didn't have any idea about law really or you know only only what I'd learned at the magistrates court so I thought the post room would be a good place to start and then I could learn a little bit more about how a legal firm ran and the different types of law um, that they did so yeah started the post room and then basically moved into the finance team after that then I was also helping on reception I was, I was doing all sorts of stuff whilst I was simultaneously doing the Silex qualification, uh, evenings and weekends. Uh, And then I just hassled the the different partners, really, of the different heads of department in each of the different uh, departments, until one of them said, yeah, all right, you can come into my department. And it turned out to be the Wills and Probate Department. So uh, that that was where I did my fee earning work. That's great. So you mentioned that you qualified through the Silex route. Now, um, one could say that you could have done like a foundation law degree and then, you know, qualified and then get to do the LPC and a training contract. That would be like the traditional route if somebody didn't do A-levels. So what made you choose the Silex path over doing that route instead? I, I like the flexibility of the Silex route. I liked being able to work as well to build up my experience much earlier than perhaps the more traditional route. I think some law firms are, are traditional and slow to change. Mm. Uh, and looking back, the traditional route, well, uh, the way I see it now is, is the traditional route, everybody does the same exams, they go to the similar universities, they get taught to learn the same way. That then means that people are solving problems the same way where the diversity that you get from 
uh, what the new SQE, Silex, CLC. You actually get people from quite diverse backgrounds who have come to look at problems in different ways, and that can actually then mean that you're helping clients solve their problems in in different ways. Great. So um, apart from like the flexibility that you've just mentioned, what other advantages did you see in pursuing the Silex route? Another another benefit of the Silex route uh, was financial. So it meant I got to earn money whilst I was learning. Uh, and in addition to that, actually, uh, the firm is very good and supported some of that cost as well. So uh, I ended up ended up qualifying not uh, having big student loans or anything like that. And I know that, you know, talk, talking to potential trainee solicitor candidates at the moment, uh, especially over the last like, 10 years, they they can come out, well, they can qualify owing substantial amounts of money. So it's, it's actually really um, a great point that you touched on about your firm helping you um, partially with the funding for the Silex route. So in my current role as um, a legal training advisor, I frequently encounter um, a lot of potential um, or aspiring students who express concerns um, about the recognition of their Silex qualification and its potential impact on their career perspective. So there's kind of like a common perception that a Silex qualification might not be regarded as highly as, you know, a solicitor qualification. What are your thoughts on this and has this perception affected your career journey in any way? So no, it hasn't affected my career journey at all. I agree that the title solicitor uh, is probably more understood than chartered legal executive or licensed conveyancer. But um, from my experience, clients just expect when they come to a law firm for that lawyer to get the law right. I think only maybe two times in 20 years have I had someone find out that they'd be getting an illegal executive and then ask for a solicitor. It's never held me back and I don't know of anyone that it has held back. I think it actually comes down to the person involved and whether they want that solicitor badge or not. While we're still on the topic of the solicitor route, the Solicitors Regulation Authority, as you probably are aware of, they introduced a new SQE route to become a solicitor in England and Wales. What's your take on this new qualifications? So it's some, yeah, something that we're very aware of, actually. The Solicitors Qualifying Exam, or SQE, is going to be what it is one centralised assessment that every solicitor has to take on routes qualification. It's broken down into two parts. Uh, part one is the examinations, SQE1, which is a multiple choice exam on the functioning knowledge. And then SQE2 is testing the practical skills through advocacy and written tests. Part two is the qualifying work experience or QWE. That replaces the traditional training contract. I think actually that it dem the, Q the new QWE demonstrates the value of the qualifying employment that's always been part of Silex. I agree, definitely. So what do you think the potential impact on the new SQE would have on aspiring lawyers? We're seeing a lot more uh, SQE applications and traditional LPC applications. I know that they've said that the LPC won't be replaced until 2030, but I think that will end actually a lot sooner. It will get to a point where it won't be viable for these companies to provide the LPC anymore because there just won't be the people doing it. So I think it might actually, mm -hmm. that transition might happen a lot quicker. I agree. So just touching on, um, you said you've received like applications from people of the SQE. So when it comes to like the recruitment process and like job prospects at your firm, would you consider applicants who have qualified through the SQE route or currently in the process for the SQE route? Both. Are we, uh, I, I don't tend to look at look for grades. When we interview, we look for attitude. So you, you can learn the law, but you can't really teach attitude. So we, we're quite a diverse firm. We've got traditional solicitors, we've got SQE qualified. We've also got plenty of Silex and uh, quite a few licensed commencers. Brilliant. It's good to know because, you know, um, there are people out there who do worry that, OK, this is a new route. I don't know about the longevity. I don't know if I'm going to get a job afterwards. 
So it's um, really fantastic that your firm considers, you know, people with that qualification or currently on that pathway. So if we move on to discuss about your transition from fee earner, like you've mentioned earlier, to operation no manager, I'm sure this was a really big step in your career. So you transitioned from a fee earner role in private practice to an operational manager position within a top 100 national brand legal service provider. So how did this transition come about and how did your role change during this process? So I was dealing with in private and private practice for about 10 years. I then decided to move almost 200 miles from where I grew up <laughs> <laughs> to COP, COP Legal Services in 2009. So CLS started in 2006 uh, as a personal injury firm. And at the time, everybody was talking about them and Tesco Law and how the, a national brand legal service provider was the future of the law in the UK. And I, I agreed at the time and so moved to CLS. They'd only been providing wills and probate services for a couple of years when I moved, and it was an, a really exciting time. Uh, it became an ABS in 2012, and I moved from running my own files to managing a team of about 30 case handlers. That then meant I got more involved in the operational side of things, uh, including change management, IT, compliance, and also uh, helped set up the first regional office at the COP headquarters in Manchester. So it was yeah, an incredibly exciting time. Sounds it indeed. So um, how did your perspective change, your perspective of the legal field that is, as you transitioned from a fee earner to an operations manager? So I like helping people. And whether that's helping someone who's recently bereaved or helping someone solve a problem, that's what gets me up in the morning, still does. <laughs> so in my role then and now, I'm very lucky to get to do that every day. That's amazing. So were there any unexpected challenges you faced during this transition? The biggest was I'm a very organised and methodical person, um, and that's fine when you're running your own files. But when you're helping other people and they don't run the file quite the same way that you would, that can be quite challenging. But yeah. uh, another aspect of the job that I really enjoy is coaching and mentoring, and that quickly became a really important aspect of that job and actually turned out to be one of my favourite parts. So how would you say your current role at Stephen Rimmer contributes to the overall legal services provided by the firm? I'm a, I'm a partner and practice manager and I'm also the compliance officer for legal practice, which is the COLP. As, as the COLP, I'm responsible for ensuring compliance with the many regulations that govern the law <laughs> firm. Uh, and as a practice manager, I'm responsible for the day to day running of the firm, such as IT, marketing and people management. So uh, not a fee earning role, but certainly quite integral to the running of a law firm and therefore legal services. Perfect. So um, at Stephen Rimmer, do you see many individuals applying to become paralegals? Yeah, we get lots of applications. I think it's a great way to start and get experience in law. As I said earlier, I don't put a great deal of value on grades on a CV, but what we really look at is transferable skills and attitude in the interview. I think the qualifying work experience in SQE is going to open up a lot of diversity as the training contract was very competitive. And with the QWE, you can get your two years across lots of different companies, including voluntary work. So if the paralegal work then does meet the requirements for the QWE, I think we'll see a lot of paralegals using that um, who haven't been able to secure a training contract previously. So just to touch on, you did mention that you don't particularly look or focus too much on the grades. So what specific qualities or attributes makes a candidate stand out when applying for such a role? Transferable skills. So customer service experience. You learn a lot as a as a paralegal or on the way that you should run a file, how you should uh, manage expectations. And a lot of that can be taken from you know, working in a shop. I think. Uh, so yeah, we look look for transferable skills. Someone who's going to be collaborative. So we're not trying to be the apprentice or anything like that. We're not looking <laughs> for people that come in and bang the table and demand to have it their way. We're looking yeah. for a collaborative approach because you need to you need to work well with the people, the existing people in the firm, but also work well with the client. So how would you say paralegals or any sort of person who joins like your firm at an entry level point? 
how can they identify opportunities to go beyond their assigned responsibilities? Take the time to learn the practical application of the law. As I said, client expectations and how to manage them can't be learned from a book. Uh, you learn the importance of recording time. And if you understand how work is priced and scoped for when you do have your own files, all, all that experience is invaluable. I think the practical experience. That's great. So from your perspective, how can aspiring lawyers make the most of their paralegal experience? They should help build the firm's culture. That can only be done by its people. And that may be getting involved in networking, marketing events or, or uh, identifying. This comes back to the diversity point. Of if you've had different experiences and you've learned in different ways, you might be able to see gaps or better ways of doing things. Uh, and that can be really important for if, if law firms are going to stay relevant to the way that we deliver legal services to clients, which is changing quite quickly at the moment. So as someone who's followed a unique path into the legal field, what key pieces of advice would you give to aspiring lawyers who are just starting their journeys? Biggest one is don't be afraid to step outside your comfort zone. Take opportunities as they come along. That might be going to networking events or volunteering for something outside of work hours or something as simple as just starting to post on LinkedIn. These things can seem very scary, but everyone feels that. I still get, I still get nervous getting into, you know, going into a room where you don't know anybody. It's really good you touched on networking. How important would you say that is in today's climate? I'm, I'm a big advocate of networking and building a good, good network of people. It might not be that you need to get in contact with someone immediately, but to, to strike up a relationship with someone that could in two, three, four, you know, even 10 years time, mutually become beneficial for, for you both. That could be something as simple as referring work, putting them in touch with someone who needs some help or something like that. So I think networks, yeah, really important. Really good. So for the listeners who are like completely introverted and this might scare them, oh my gosh, I've got to go out and network. How would you suggest that they go about it? I know LinkedIn can be one avenue, but is are there yes. any other ways that they can go around? Like, are there events that they can go to? What are the specific like strategies they can take to network? There's, actually, there's, a, there's a very good book called How to Talk to Anybody. And the best piece of advice in, in that book um, that I took was everybody's feeling the same way. So okay. I know because I used to do it myself, I used to sit there thinking, oh, I've got to think of a really intelligent question to ask this person, it's <laughs> an advice break, but you don't. It can be as simple as how did you get there today or well, oh, the weather's bad or something like that. And the other person who's thinking exactly the same as you uh, will be so grateful to have that icebreaker that you can then strike up a, a conversation. So don't don't be afraid to just small talk, really, just just to get yeah. things going. On the introverted side of things, write articles for the firm, um, offer to um, maybe do do an interview or something like this about, about the firm, about its culture, because that would help with recruitment and retention and things like that, which are really important to law firms. So as you can imagine, especially since COVID happened, online learning has become an integral part of legal education, particularly for those who are already in work. Could you share some advice on how aspiring lawyers can effectively balance their online learning with their work commitments? Thank you, Rebecca. I've got a question for you on this. <laughs> yeah. how, how has your online offering changed since COVID? Because obviously that was a massive shift. Yeah. So since then, um, we've really taken a very digitally hands-on approach. So, for example, we have like online proctored examinations for most of our courses, extensive tutor support as well for people who may be a bit worried because, you know, there are some people who haven't necessarily done the online before. And the first thing that comes to their mind is, oh, my gosh, what if I'm too by myself? What if I'm too independent and I need to ask a question and there's no one there to not essentially handhold, but to guide me? Our tutors are super responsive, um, responds at least within 24 hours, which is quality service that a lot of our learners repeatedly come back and say, oh, wow. I really like the fact that my tutor is there to support me and it's not just an online course that I'm studying from, you know, a random place in the world and no one's there to actually help me. So things like that, really. It's not just watching a video. 
No, so that's part no. of it. I mean, they have on-demand access to all their materials. So there are, like, for most of them, pre-recorded lectures that they can tune yeah. into at their convenience because we do take into consideration that people are coming from all sorts of backgrounds. So whether that is, um, you know, somebody who's juggling a single parenthood, somebody who's working full-time, um, many, many different factors. So it would be quite, kind of disadvantaged if we did live um, workshops or lectures all the time because not everybody can meet them so yeah. if we do hold a live lecture they will be pre-recorded so that they can catch up at a more convenient time and then the lectures are just there on demand so whenever they are ready um, they can just tune into their education any questions our tutors are there to guide them through the process as well. So I really like data so do you get to see so sort of the peaks and troughs of when people are viewing? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. have a, a really, really good interactive system called Moodle. So it actually allows us to track the progress someone is in their education. And we often send out um, just nice, friendly emails, letting them know oh, you've been inactive for a while. Is there anything else we can help you with? And then they'll come back to us and say, yeah, you can help me. Thank you for reaching out and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's a really good system in place. Yeah. So is that e evening as a weekend you see a lot of more activity, do you think? Or? I would reckon um, the weekends would naturally be where you would see a lot of activity because, you know, the week is over, you can actually sit down and unwind. But equally, it's just down to the individual and what they have going on in their lives. So it could be weekdays and it could be weekends. Yeah. So do you have any advice for people who are struggling to balance online learning with any sort of commitments, whether that's work or just family life? Just, just go for a provider that's very flexible, I think. We've got a few people at the moment that are studying their CLC and the feedback from them has been fantastic on, on not only the, the quality of the course itself, but also the flexibility because they are working full time, all of them mm. actually, uh, and learning at the same time. So I think, yeah, having that, that flexibility is very important. Uh, again, especially going back to the COVID, I mean, a lot more people are a lot more used to going online now to learn. Yep. I would still advocate a bit of person in person learning because again you get to build up your network of course yeah yeah so just for your future outlook on aspiring paralegals or lawyers where do you see the future heading for aspiring paralegals and those looking to become lawyers are there any trends or changes you anticipate with, with the uh, sqe i think it's going to open that up to a lot more people the Silex has already been there, but it's a little less known and understood still, I think. So we, we'll always have a conversation. So if they're if they're very determined to get the solicitor's badge, then we will we'll steer them towards the SQE now. If they're not too hung up on that, then it will be Silex. Or if they're absolutely sure that they know that they don't want to do any other area of law and they just want to go very specific, so, for example, residential conveyancing or private practice or something like that, then we would steer them towards the CLC or the practitioner course there. So there's a lot of lot more choice available than that there was when I first started out. So um, any final thoughts or advice you would offer aspiring legal professionals? Any Anything that stands out the most to you or something so you I, wish you were told when you started off? No, I, I mean... I wouldn't be where I was today if I hadn't gone through the experiences that I had done. So, uh, you know, I'm very grateful for that. I'm not a massive risk taker, but when I see an opportunity uh, and on balance, I think it would do more good than harm, then I will go for it. And I think that's that's been quite a, a pivotal thing in my career that I've been prepared to get outside my comfort zone, talk talk to people. Move, move jobs into a, a fairly unknown um, new provider, um, which gave me massive amounts of experience. It's probably experience. Get as much experience as you can. That that cannot hurt to get to get experience. And whether, but actually balancing that with don't move around jobs too much. And that, that's quite a bit of an oxymoron, really. Um, so yeah, because you. You need to, with law, it's all about reputation uh -huh. and becoming established. And I think that's harder to maintain if you if you move around a lot. So try to develop yourself within the firm 
It's really good. And I'm glad you actually touched on the point of experience because with a lot of these new pathways, experience is a key thing that they would have to get underneath the belt. What what would you say would be a good way for people to actually get work experience? Because it's so competitive out there. A lot of firms have their different requirements. What would make them stand out to actually get like, I don't know if you, um, your firm particularly does um, vocational schemes or any sort of work placement? We do work experience with local schools. Um, we have. That's amazing. Yeah, four, four times a year we, we have people in. They, they book up very, very quickly, actually. They're always well oversubscribed. We are looking for someone with an interest in law. So they are normally studying A-level law or at mm-hmm. university studying law. Otherwise, we would probably, if, if someone applies with no legal experience whatsoever, we would probably put them into uh, more of a support role initially mm-hmm. to, to gain that experience. With the work experience placements, we tend to put them into... A, a time in each department so they can get get a well-rounded view of, of what it's like to work in busy legal practice and that always actually goes down really well and um, we've had people come back to us who've had work experience with us and then they join us as oh, that's brilliant. paralegals so it's it, yeah it's very good to have those connections with local schools fantastic so lastly what's next for you are there any upcoming goals projects or any areas you're excited to explore in your personal or professional journey so compliance uh, is a big part of my role <laughs> yeah. and regulation and it's ever changing and something else I also enjoy is um, IT. So majority of law firms, us included, are still working from Microsoft Office to maintain <laughs> our systems. So Excel spreadsheets, Word documents yep. for file audits, for compliance, things like that. And I'm currently working on a very exciting thing with a company. Uh, who's a, a startup in uh, the red tech space, um, which should really help uh, sort of bring bring everything together for a compliance officer. So they've got a sort of overarching view of what's going on in the firm, rather than quite a segmented view that's quite manual to keep up to date. So that that's actually really exciting. Very exciting and. Just the fact that you can start off um, within law and then have certain components into the like the IT or tech world is really good for those people who actually still like tech, but they also like law. So the fact that they can develop into something like that, that's very interesting. That's a huge space, actually, um, legal tech. That's going to be probably the most exciting part of law, I think, for the next <laughs> so, 10 or 20 years. And whether that comes down to the assisting the lawyer to do their job uh, that's one element to it i think the 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 bigger area is actually how legal services are delivered to clients and that's mm. that's changing a lot well thank you grant for joining us today thank i quite you, thoroughly enjoyed that and i'm pretty sure our listeners will find that extremely helpful thank you for tuning into the legal navigator podcast We hope you found today's episode informative and engaging. If you have any questions or need more information, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can send us an email at info at ltckent.co.uk or visit our website at ltckent.co.uk. Until next time, stay tuned for more episodes.